to address why even look at this stuff. Uh, as I told you, uh, people asked me principally, honestly, two questions while I was there last. Uh, why does the world hate us? And uh, is this the beginning of Gog and Magog? So let's take, let's do a deep dive tonight. And like I said, uh, I, can, I got the scriptures uh, here. I'll be reading a lot of scriptures. The references are for your consideration. You can look it up while we're reading. It's up to you, or you can just sit and listen. There's no right or wrong, wrong way to do this, but the notes are, are a guideline for you to look up later because you're going to hear a lot of information. This is uh, truly a deep dive uh, into eschatology on, on a certain level. And, uh, but uh, I have, I have uh, taught this lecture around the country, and, uh, and what, like I said, what your pastor tells me, you guys got this. So let's, let's um, take notes, uh, and maybe, Pastor, and maybe after tonight, because there, you know, there's not a time crunch in, people, in the food and all of that stuff. After we're done tonight, depends on how long-winded I am. My wife always says, they just want a yes or a no. I, I will tell you how it's made, and it's just my twitch that I have. And I know when I talk to my beloved, I know when she zones out, she kind of glazes over, you know, like, you know, she's looking at me, but she's not there. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you're not hearing anything. She goes, I love you. I said, I love you too. Yeah. Just a yes or a no, right? And, uh, but anyway, but we're going we're gonna to have, um, hopefully this will be intriguing and informative for you and will encourage you and bless you. But more than all of that, prepare you. Jesus said, watch and pray. Be ready. That's what this is. Okay. So let's begin. Uh, like I said, you can read along, just listen, follow along, fill it, whatever you want to do. Uh, but basically, I'll be doing a lot of reading. And I'm not kidding. I told the folks, you know, I'm blind as a bat. I got size 24 font. You don't believe me, there it is. And uh, that, you ever watch a president, he, he'll read about two or three sentences and then move the paper over. That's like size 64 font, you know? So anyway, there's a reason for that. Okay, in all seriousness, let's go ahead. Okay, first of all, why study the signs of the times? Let's just look at that for a brief moment. In Matthew 16, one through four, the Lord said these words. He says, uh, then the Pharisees and Sadducees came testing him, and asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. Oh, there's so many people just looking for signs, you know, uh, books. Be careful the books on blue moons, red moons, pink moons, date setters. They've got a secret people, and no one else knows the secret that I know. Watch out for those folks. Uh, he would also show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, what is evening you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. He says, hypocrites? Ouch. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern. Now those are the key words there. You cannot discern the signs of the times, the signs that are all around you, right in front of your face. And we live in a generation of biblical ignorance, and they don't know what's right in front of their nose. He says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign like this, and no sign will be given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. You know, the death, burial, and resurrection. He's slamming these religious fanatics. You know, it's always the religious fanatic that causes the problems. I don't care. Christian, Muslim, Jewish. It's always the religious nut out there. That, that, that irritates the situation. And then he left them and departed. Scripture says, well, Matthew 16, verse 3 and 4 tells us that this is very simply a religious, a religious question. We study the signs of the times to be able to recognize, now listen, and then you write it down in your notes, what? We study the signs of the times to be able to recognize Messiah. That's important, so that our hearts can be right with God. To look 
inwardly for spiritual signs. And this is an important statement here. Not spectacular signs. The blood moves and all that nonsense. But to look inside for spiritual signs. Watch and pray. Prayer is very internal. Prayer is very personal. However, there are true signs. We're going to talk about some of those true signs to acknowledge. Now, in Matthew 24, uh, before we read those verses that are in your notes there, uh, in the previous chapter, Matthew 23, was the last time Jesus taught in the temple. And if you read Matthew 23, you will find that Jesus raked over the coals, the religious fanatics, the swell unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and everybody. I mean, he raked them over the coals, man. I mean, he, boy, he laid it down quite hard. The last time he spoke in the temple. Now, chapter 24 begins to unfold. They leave the temple proper. They go out and down the valley of the Kidron Valley, headed towards Gethsemane. Now, the Kidron Valley is the same valley the soldiers came and Judas came, as you recall. He says, the one I kiss, you take. And, of course, you don't kiss a rabbi like that. You show disrespect. But that valley called the Kidron Valley is the same valley that, that, that David referred to, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Same valley, the Kidron Valley. So they walked through, stepped over the brook Kidron. It, it, back then there was a brook. It's not there now. But it would have been filled with blood and water. Why? Because Herod embellished the temple and he created a drainage system. The part of the sacrifice, sacrificial blood was drained into the brook Kidron. The symbolism there is profound. Jesus and the disciples walked over, walked through this little brook filled with water and blood, a precursor of what was about to happen. Okay? So in Matthew 24, we have this amazing chapter. Oh, I, I have done a series. If you, if you plug into our podcast thing, there's like a, I forget how many lectures, I think like six or seven lectures on Matthew 24. But this is what the word says. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. He just got done raking over the coals, the religious. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. What is so significant about that? Well, there are 35 acres of building here. It's huge. This is one of the wonders of the world. Herod embellished it. Okay? So he said, the disciples came, look at, look at all this, Lord. Look at the buildings. Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? He says, well, surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here uh, upon another that shall not be thrown down. And now he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. This blew them away. You gotta understand the statement he just made. The holiest place in, in, in Jerusalem, he says, this is gonna be torn down, boys. What? Lord? What? How can this be? That's quite a tall tale. So, a couple of the disciples, some say it was Peter, Andrew, and James, some say it was Peter, Andrew, and John. We don't know. At least three of the disciples came. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And the end of the age. Wow. Wow. Great questions. Powerful questions. You have to read, ladies and gentlemen, you have to read Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21, and Matthew chapter 24 to get an answer for all three questions. But we're going to stay in Matthew 24 where Jesus addresses part of the question. Well, Jesus said in verse 4 of Matthew 24, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. Well, there's a lot of deception today. We talked about that in one of our meetings here the last week, yesterday. Uh, where, you know, certain organizations, they deceive the Christians, and, you know, it, it, you have to be careful today. He says, take heed that no one deceives you, 
For many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah and will deceive many and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. What in the world is he saying? This is referred to as a Talmudic phrase. It's a big fancy word meaning it was Jewish oral religious wording, theology, teaching that was floating around and then eventually be, they began to write down these things and it's like a 24 volume series of what is called the Talmud and it's broken up in different sections. And basically what it is, it teaches Jewish people how to live and how to interpret the scripture. So this is a Talmudic phrase that was being floated out there by the rabbis. He says, you will hear wars and rumors of wars and people will deceive you saying I'm the Messiah. He says, don't be deceived, don't be duped, don't, don't, don't get shaken up over this, it's just the way it is. Wars and rumors of wars, it's the Middle East, tribe against tribe. It's been going on for, for millennia, tribe against tribe. He says, but the end is not yet. Then, in verse 7, there's a paradigm shift. It's still a Talmudic phrase that the Lord is drawing from what the rabbis were teaching, and he, draw, he drew a focus to it. He says, however, guys, listen to me. He says, local wars, don't worry about it. You know, don't worry about it. And he says, there will be people out there writing stupid books and trying to deceive people. Don't worry about it. But this is what I want you to pay attention to. He says, however, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these, the Lord said, are the beginning of sorrows or birth pains or labor pains. And any woman who has given birth can attest to this. Each labor pain becomes more intense right up to the moment of giving birth. What are we giving birth to, ladies and gentlemen? We're giving birth to a kingdom. Thy kingdom come. But between now and then, there will be labor pains. And we'll talk about that more uh, later on. So we shift from local conflicts now to global conflicts. Now at that time, global meant the Mediterranean world. 2,000 years later, we understand what global means even more clearly. And you have to ask yourself questions. Has there been anything global in terms of wars? Yes. It was in the 20th century, World War I and II. Have there been any global diseases? Yes, in the past, but it's all in this context of the global wars and earthquakes and famine, this is part of what we do to help eliminate the hungry kids and the old people. But unprecedented in history, so he's shifting their attention from local to global stuff here. So let's put it in context. So what? So what? what does all that mean? Well, you have to consider, remember, there are true signs. He says, don't look for spectacular signs, look for spiritual signs, look for inside signs. Look how you look for Messiah and all these things. And you look inwardly, make sure that your heart is right, that you're watching, you're praying, and you're focused on what and discerning the signs of the times around you. So what are some of the true signs? And let me just give you a few of these. One is the rebirth of Israel. Ezekiel 37, Amos 9, if you're following your notes. Uh, after 2,400 years, in the 20th century, the same time frame of global wars. The same time frame as history is able to record global famine, global diseases. We, we just came out of one of those diseases. The rebirth of Israel. They were scattered around the world for 2,400 years and they came back to the same chunk of real estate that they started they don't have all the land promised to them yet, but they're going back. And as I shared with you this morning, there are more Jews now in Israel than in any country, other country in the world. They'll come from the northeast, south, and west, the prophet said. And this is the context of the latter days. And 
they give you the list of all their wars. All their wars, as you look at the wars, each war is, was more intense than the previous war. This last war was a very intensive labor pain where they decapitated children and all the stuff we talked to you about this morning. Okay? So, one of the truth of science is the rebirth of the nation Israel, 1948. UN carved it up after world, one of the global wars. They carved out this chunk of real estate, just so happens to be the same real estate they had set a millennia ago. That's a true sign. But the restoration will be progressive. We have to understand this. This is why they don't have all the real estate yet. And this is why Jews are still going back to Israel. They, some don't know why they go back. They just feel compelled. Some go for religious reasons. Some know this prophecy. I've been asked, are you going to make Aliyah? I could, technically, because of my mother's heritage that makes me Jewish, that I could become a citizen of Israel if I so chose to do that. Maybe one day I will. But the return will be progressive. Uh, in Ezekiel 37, the prophet speaks to this. Verses 1 through 8, the prophet Ezekiel speaks to the fact that when he start returning to Israel, it'll first, they will first return in unbelief. Unbelief, in your notes. The dry bones that he mentions. The emphasis on the dry bones. Seriously dead bones of the vision that Ezekiel saw. Verse 8 says, Indeed, as I looked, Upon this vision of dry bones in this valley the prophet saw he says I looked the sinews and the flesh came upon them it was this was a real funky vision I mean you know listen you know sometimes you know you those of you before the you drink too much you see things this isn't what's going on here this is a Holy Spirit thing and but he's seeing this really disturbing vision can you imagine how scary? A valley of skeletons. Now all of a sudden, sinews and muscles and things start to come upon these skeletons. This is what we're reading here. It's a vision he is seeing. He says, the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over. But look what he said. There was no breath. Breath is ruach. The ruach hakodesh. God, the Holy Spirit. Ruach is spirit. Hakodesh means the holy. But the, but the prophet said there was no spirit, Holy Spirit, within them that creates life. This is what the emphasis is here. So they're back. They first go back in unbelief. And indeed, they went back because they wanted to escape the crazy that happened in Europe. They took a swampy area and made it flourish. And they were attacked. I mean, just just minutes after Ben Gurion announced their freedom, they were attacked. Look on your list, you see the wars. Verse 11, Israel's hope is going to be diminished, the prophet said. Uh, in the diaspora, the dispersion, that's a fancy word for dispersion throughout the world. The goyim, the nation. Verse 11, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. You just got to read scripture, and scripture will interpret scripture for you if you read it enough. This is the whole house of Israel you're seeing, prophet uh, Ezekiel. They indeed say our bones are dry. That means very, very, very dry. They're dead here. He says, and our hope is lost, the nation is saying, and we ourselves are cut off. We're killed. We're cut off. We're dead. But then, if you continue to read the chapter, verses 9, 10, 12 through 14, then all of a sudden, Israel begins to believe. Verse 14, I will put my ruach in you, my spirit in you. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, we are seeing this today. Revival is breaking out in Israel. The Holy Spirit is coming upon people. They're coming to faith. Jesus said, you will not see me again, Israel, as you wept over Israel until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they are coming to faith, mainly the young people. Amen and amen. This is one of the true signs. You will not see me again until you say. And when they come to faith, they go, Oh, man, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, praise you, Lord. Praise you. It was you all along. Oh, oh, oh. And I will place you in your own land, he continues, after the Spirit comes upon them. And you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says yud heh the unspeakable name of God, Adonai, or Hashem, the Jews will say, the name. Oh, and you will know. My sheep hear my voice. They know me. They follow me. <coughs> Verses 15 to 27, Israel will be reunited from the nations, and this is ongoing, even as we speak. Verse 21, then say to them, thus says the Lord God, you know, oh, let me digress for a second. A little Hebrew lesson. Uh, Lord God. It's Lord is yud heh uh, They would say Hashem, the name of Adonai. That's why the Pharisees got upset at the disciples of the Lord because they would call him Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they got upset. You're calling him God. They knew that word. It's also used for kings, but in terms of God, it's used for God. All right? Uh, the Lord God is, is yud heh vav Elohim. Genesis 1. Those of you who came up, okay, we'll learn this. God says, God spoke, and it happened. Let there be light, let there be land, let there be water, let there be this, let there be that. God spoke, and it happened. That's Elohim. By the time you get to chapter 2, all of a sudden, Moses does a paradigm shift. All of a sudden, you start reading, Lord God, instead of just God. Well, when you see things like that, take note. What world is Moses saying? What is Lord God? The yod heh vav the unspeakable name. yod heh vav is the God of mercy. What was about to happen? The fall of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, these creatures that God created, blew into his breath, or blew into his nostrils the breath, the essence of God, made him a living being. God knew that they would need mercy. All of a sudden it was God, 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 the sovereign architect, the one who speaks, the one who creates, the one who manages, the one who's in control, to now merciful architect, merciful God, Lord God, Lord God, Lord God. God took the animal, first time an animal was killed, covered Adam and Eve, they needed mercy. This is the paradigm shift in Genesis. From the sovereign architect to the merciful God. <coughs> because of what was about to happen. Okay, back to the text. Then say to them, thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, the Goyim, the Gentiles, the bacon lovers, the menes, eaters, you know, uh, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And then Isaiah 25 speaks to you, they, then they will completely believe. That's where they say, this is our God. We have waited for him. It was him all along. We have waited for him. We will be glad and will rejoice in his salvation. Salvation is the Hebrew word Yeshua. Yeshua is how you say Jesus. They will rejoice. They have waited for him, for we will be glad and rejoice in his Yeshua. His salvation is Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. It's okay to get Pavacostal in here. All right? It's okay. It's okay. You're my friends. Just go for it. Okay, another true sign, not only the restoration, it will be progressive, go from local wars to global things. At the same time, Israel returns after 2,400 years of being dispersed. And then a progressive restoration. That's in the, We're in the middle of that right now. Another true sign is this battle of God and make God. And just to remind you what I shared with you this morning, soldiers asked me, 
Is this the beginning? They don't know Yeshua. They don't know Jesus, this, this group, particular group, and there are other soldiers. But they know the Old Testament. They know the Tanakh. They know the prophets. They know enough to know that Ezekiel spoke about a war right prior to the Messiah's coming. Now they're looking for the first coming, we're looking for the second coming. And all the rabbis, I'm telling you, all the rabbis, all the rabbis, all the rabbis know this, and they go to the Kotel, that wall that they pray, up to the Mount of Olives and pray, and they're praying, they look at the world around them, what's going on around them, and they are praying for the coming of the Mashiach. Evangelicals are aware of this war. They are discerning the signs of the times, and they're keeping one eye on what's going on in Israel right now. They know this. Orthodox Christians believe this, and some Catholic Christians believe this. The soldiers believe this. And they ask me, they know what I believe. They know my mother was Jewish. They ask me, do you is this do you think this is the beginning of? Isn't that a great question? Let's talk about that. We do, we did. Well, let's look at what the scripture says, what the prophet says about this war. Okay, now we're in chapter 38 of Ezekiel, if you're following along. Uh, verses 1 through 4, you can look at it, listen to it. Now the word of the Lord, that's your day, Bob, hey, the merciful God. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, G-O-G, it's not a misspelling. People think, oh, is that God? No, it's Gog. We'll find out what this is in a minute. The land of Magog, the, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, prophesy against him and say... Thus says the Lord God, that merciful architect, Behold, I'm against you, O God, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I've turned you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, and all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords. Okay, so what are these names? What are these crazy names? God. Some, the, uh, the young man, that I've met, I keep on forgetting his name. But who's the other boy that I read? Is it him? He said, man, it sounds like Star Wars name. I said, yeah, it kind of set does, doesn't it? Like, you know, God, hey, God, that's Star Wars. You know, where do you think Star Wars got some of those names? You know what I'm saying? They looked into the Bible and they said, we got to have some funky names here. But Gog means roof. Magog means out of the covering or out from the roof or from the Hebrew Gog which means one who gathers, Magog, one who is exalted. Andrew of Caesarea, early 6th century theologian, said this about this text. He says, the present revelation here foretells future events. It is written that Gog and Magog will come toward the end of the age. And he's right. Now, Gog means an exalted power, a power entity from the north. Some say it's Russia, some say it's Turkey. It doesn't matter, but it's a power entity from the north, and we'll find out what happens with this power entity. Verses 5 and 6, uh, there's a coalition that is empowered by this Gog, Magog, Meshach, and Tubal, they, they all settled, the tribes themselves settled in what today is referred to as southern Russia and part of Turkey. But they did settle in that region. That's why people say, well, it must be Russia. But they did settle there. Verses 5 and 6, you have the list of a coalition that aligns with Gog, Magog, Meshach, and Tubal. One, and anytime you get a list in the Bible, always the first thing listed has the preeminence. The first name we read is Persia. What is Persia? Who are, who, who are the Persians? Today they're called Iranians. And uh, Iran is a 20th century border. Now, Iran, the Persian Empire was much, much bigger, but we're talking about 20th century borders now. 
But nevertheless, person, if you ask a person, say, I know a lot of Persians, I know a lot of Persians who are Christians, I know a lot of Persians who are Muslims, people mistake them for being Arab because the majority of Persians are Muslim. But if you say, are you Arab, they'll spit. They say, I don't want to be identified as an Arab. That was wild donkey of a people, and there's, I think somewhere in the Bible that speaks to that. And Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, what a name, Gomer, and all its troops. The house of Togarma from the far north and all of its troops, many people are with you. What you have here is Persia, Iran, the Iranians, Ethiopia, Libya, referencing African nations. Gomer settled in and around Eastern, uh, no, Western Turkey and uh, Eastern Europe, the tribes uh, in history. Togarma is just downright Turkey. Okay. So the idea is this coalition of nations connected to Iran, coalition of tribes, coalition of powers that are very Persian friendly. Turkey is Persian friendly. Eastern Europe uh, connected to Russia, very Iranian friendly. Uh, even the kings of the East, China, North Korea, but that's another lecture for another time. But what you have here is Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, Togarma. These are tribal areas and nations of peoples that surround Israel that align with what today we call Iran or Persia. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, chapter 38, verses 11 and 12. Now, this is interesting. Uh, there will be some sort of peace agreement or an understanding, uh, and uh, it has to do with unwalled villages. If you're looking in your notes, unwalled villages. Verse 11, you will say, speaking now to Israel, you will, uh, you will say, uh, rather, uh, Gog and Magog, you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. Listen, 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 listen. Why would you have a wall to begin with? To defend yourself. There's been a lot of talk about walls lately. We all know. Okay, but why would you have a wall? To protect yourself. Why do you have a castle? To protect yourself. You don't need a wall if you feel you are at peace. This is what happened in 73 at the Yom Kippur War. Israel lowered their bayonets. This is what happened October 7. Again, holy days. Israel said, we're at... No, it's, they lowered their bayonets. And bad things happened. Terrible things. I guarantee you, Israel will not do it a third time. You will say, I'll go up against the land of unwalled villages. I'll go to a peaceful people, speaking of Israel, who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls. Now, the prophet is emphasizing the without wall thing. No walls, without walls. They don't have a defense. They feel they're at peace. And having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty and to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited. Remember, they were not inhabited. Now Israel's being inhabited progressively against the people who have, uh, against the people gathered from all the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. Wow. This is why the rabbis are taking note. This is why the soldiers are saying, is this the beginning? This is why the evangelical scholars are going, huh, keep one eye on what's going on over here. This is why the Orthodox, this is why the Catholic, they're looking at this, those who are conservative in the Catholic region of things, they're looking at this and saying, huh, huh, something is going on. It's bigger than us. It has nothing to do with America. It has everything to do with Israel. Everything. Okay, let's continue. And it's, it, 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 this continue. Oh, verse 13 in chapter 38. Sheba, the Dan. There are some names for you. The merchants of Tarshish and all of their young lions will say to you, have you come to take a plunder? Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, and your coalition. What are you doing? Have you gathered your army to take a booty, to carry away silver and gold, and to take away livestock and goods, and to take a great plunder? 
what are you guys doing? Who is Sheba, Dedan, and Tarshish? Sheba and Dedan settled in today what is called Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Who's trying to broker peace with Israel? It's Saudi Arabia. They don't want a war. You have Shuni, uh, Sunni, Shiites, the, the division in Islam, and Iran's one, Saudi is another. He said, what are you doing? Spain, even Spain has the hoods, but to speak up here. You know, I mean, the Spanish, what are you going to do? <laughs> and they go, what are you doing? And all the young lines, these are the young men, the leaders, the young leaders, the, the alpha male and female leaders that will be on the scene at the time. What are you doing? This is nonsense. This is crazy. You're going to start a global war. Exactly. Then in 38, verses 14 through chapter 39, verse 16, you will read a lot of things about natural and supernatural intervention because this war is going hot and heavy. Did I tell you, even today, the, the, the truce thing broke down about the hostages. Listen, you pray for the hostages and specifically pray for their salvation. I'm telling you, and I know people who work in Intel in that region. They tell me these hostages. Now they released some. You saw little Abigail this morning. Got her fifth birthday was released. And some of the hostages were released. But people are afraid, the experts are afraid that these hostages are dead, will be killed if they're alive. Because this is the only card Hamas has. And they said, we're out of this. We, we don't put, we, no, we, no. We disagree with everything. And they're, they're launching rockets back into Israel. They want to fight. They want Israel gone. They want the Jew killed. The river to deceive them. They want the Jew out of there. They don't want peace. They don't want to negotiate. This is why the other 22 Arab nations don't want them in their country. These Palestinians. Now, not all Palestinians are evil. Obviously, there are innocents on both sides. We understand this. But those who are in power of the Palestinian entities, Hamas, Fatah, they're millionaires, billionaires, they're corrupt. They want this thing to go on. And that's just a hard, cold fact. But I, my heart breaks for these innocent people. They were just celebrating most of them. They were either in a kibbutz, most were taken from this kibbutz, Barri kibbutz, which is just about three or four kilometers from where we feed the kids, where the bulldozer knocked over the fence and all this stuff started happening. And the rest are from that festival that they were celebrating with the holidays. You know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, at the end of the night, they're celebrating. Young people, old people, babies. What did they, what, what did they want with babies? Oh, they, oh. That's right, they cut their heads off. These are real brave expletives. These are evil people. Okay? But you will read about natural and supernatural invent intervention. Follow your notes. But I love this part. What's coming to hold on? Get your Babacostal hat on. Here we go. However, verse 18 of chapter 38, and it will come to pass at the same time when Gog comes up against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, the merciful architect, that my fury will show in my face. Oh, what is so significant about this? Let's connect this to something. Do you remember when a brother Moses was up on the mountain, and he's receiving the Ten Commandments and all of that stuff. The mountain was shaken, and this old man is walking up the mountain, and he's going up. The Lord is coming down. The rabbis say that the mountain, if you look at the text, it implies that. It's a little embellished, but it's really full story. It's as though the mountain was trying to reach up to God as God was descending. The mountain was ascending. Anyway, Moses is going up there. And God says to Moses, listen, I got you. I'm going to send a messenger. We're going to help you. We're going to do this. Meanwhile, down in the valley, down, down in the bottom of the mountain, these, uh, Israel, they made this calf, this 
bowl out of gold and they were dancing and partying and doing very stupid. And Moses, being who he was, <laughs> he had a chutzpah, man. He challenged Pharaoh. Who does that? Anyway, you know, and, and anyway, he went up. He said, all right, Lord, I don't need your help. If you read it, uh, Exodus 34, he said, I don't need your help. What I want from you, he's talking to Adonai Elohim. He's talking to the Lord God. All right, he's negotiating. Who does that? We should. God can handle it. Evangelicals are very proper. Okay. No, argue with God. He can handle whatever you throw at him. He's got you. Remember that? Argue with him if you want. So he's arguing. He says, Lord, show me your essence. Oh, what do you mean? Moses, no, you can't. This man, the essence, the Shekinah glory. That Shekinah will kill you. If you read the text, it's, it's fascinating. And so Moses is arguing with God. He says, we got to do something. And the Lord said, all right, in, this, in the narrative, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. There's a nice song about that. Okay? And it talks about his hand. Now, God doesn't have hands, face, nose, feet. It's, and we put these anthropomorphic images upon God. God is a spirit. But the hands, the face, the, this, this helps us to understand the text. All this was written so that we might understand. So in our understanding, it was as though God put him in this, this, this cave, this cleft of the rock, put his hand over him, and said, you can't see me, but you, can see, you can't see my front side, but you can see my back side. You know, it's, okay, just part of me is what the idea is. And so that happened, and if you continue to read the text in Exodus 34, God really answers his question without showing Moses his essence. He said, I am kind, I am loving, I am long-suffering. And that word just popped out. You know, God kisses you when words pop out of the scripture. He's kissing you, Psalm of Psalms, read the book. He's kissing you. So I said, all right, Lord, what's so significant about it? long suffering. So I looked and I looked and I asked our research, all my sources. You know what that means? The Hebrew is arach af. Okay, in the Hebrew. What is that? <coughs> arach is long off nose. God has a long nose. He has a long nose. What does that mean? That he, okay, I don't know about here in Wisconsin, because you guys are all refined uh, and, and all of that. But have you ever seen a person get angry? And their nostrils flare? You know, right before you, you know? Mm -hmm. That's what that's talking about. You want to see my essence, Moses? It takes me a long time for my nostrils to flare. Some translations, they hit it pretty close where they say, I am slow to anger. But that's what it means. I am slow to make my nostrils flare. That's the Hebrew. So, and it has to do with his face. Again, God is a spirit. The anthropomorphic things are for our understanding. So here we read, Thus says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face, my nostrils. Here, God's nostrils are flaring. He is ticked here. It's what the narrative is saying. You don't want God ticked anytime. Here he is ticked. I will show my that my fury will show in my face, for in my jealousy and in the fire. We forget this, that God is a consuming fire. In the fire of my wrath, I have spoken. Surely in that day, what day, the future day, when this coalition comes against Israel, empowered from this entity from the north, that rooftop thing that we learned about moments ago, God says that in that day, 
shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and the beast of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all the men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the prophet said. The steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog, that entity which empowers Persia and the coalition, and throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, meaning it will be so much confusion at that moment that they, there will be a rebellion against a civil war with each other. They will fight each other. There will be so much confusion. Who is the enemy? Who is not the enemy? And I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone, so much for the God of love here. We always talk about the God of love, God of love, and he is. But he is a consuming fire, and he says, he who touches Israel touches the pupil of my eye. His eye is being poked into right now, and God says, enough. Verse 23, look, 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 look. Thus I will magnify myself and set apart myself, sanctify myself, I will be known in the eyes of many nations, then they shall know, twice now, known, now know, that I am, we could just end it there, that I am who I am, says yod heh vav the unspeakable name of God. They, my sheep, hear my voice, they, they follow me, I know them, they know me, they follow. It's going to take this to bring the world to her knees. Remember 9-11? America got on her knees for a moment until we did it. But God here, what we just described is something beyond our imagination. And this is the question that the soldiers asked me. Do you think this is the beginning of? They know this, they believe this, and so do we. That's a precursor to other things. So the results of the invasion, you can read in your notes, chapter 39, King James translation is interesting. It says five, six of the soldiers will be killed, and, and it speaks to Armageddon there in chapter 39. It speaks of the destruction and the carnage and the judgment and all this stuff. You can read it for yourself. But then you have, okay, this war, understand in terms of the chronology, and you have a marvelous chart back there. I don't know if you have Gog and Magog on the chart, but, but it leads up to Armageddon. We all know what that one is. This war is a precursor to Armageddon. So, I mean, it, the worst hasn't happened yet. Revelation 16, Zechariah 10 through 14, you can read it for yourself. The nature of the battle, you know, now, uh, and you have to follow your notes, David speaks to this, Isaiah speaks to this, Joel, we mentioned that about the dividing of the land, part of Armageddon, the reason for Armageddon, Zechariah 14, you read all these verses yourself. But what I find fascinating is Isaiah 63. Uh, and what, okay, what's Isaiah 63? There is a progressive return of the Lord that what's often overlooked. We often just think, okay, he's going to come to the Mount of Olives, amen, here we go. No, there's Armageddon. Okay, the Lord returns because of Armageddon, the scripture speaks to this. He takes care of business in Armageddon, and that's a bloody battle, the worst battle. Those of you that have been to Nazareth, you overlook the valley, the battle, the Jezreel Valley. That's the Valley of Megiddo. That's where the last battle of man will take place. The armies of the world will meet there. It's the, Napoleon says it's the world's most natural battle. It's beautiful and lush, and how can it be? But yet it will be. The Lord will return. And then when you read the prophet Isaiah in 63, he talks about that the Lord is coming from a battle where there
bears blood on his robe. It's translated in English, poor translation. It's not a robe, it's his prayer shawl. The tali, that covering that they put over their heads has the four fringes on the corners. The tzitzit, which is the same thing the woman grabbed the hem, it wasn't the hem, the, the woman grabbed the fringe of the Lord's prayer shawl. Why? Malachi says the son of righteousness will come with healing in his wings. That's why she grabbed the wings, the fringes of his prayer shawl. Not his hem, the, the fringes. What was so shocking to the prophet Isaiah was that the Lord had blood on the holiest garment that Jews wear, his prayer shawl. You read it. Where is he going? To a place called Basra. Basra can be interpreted as sheep gate. Where is Basra? It's in Jordan. What is it called today? Petra. Jews flee during the time of the Antichrist to Petra. You can put up to a million people there. It's a, it's a city made out of the side of a mountain. If you, if you just look up the images, it'll blow you away. So the Lord comes back to Armageddon. He goes to Basra, according to Isaiah. And then we read that he, his feet lands upon the mount of olives. Now the time frame from A to B to C, we don't know, we can only assume, but that's the chronology of the Lord's return. Takes care of business in Armageddon, goes and rescues. Read the text in, in Isaiah 63. He gathers the people that are hiding there and he takes them up to Jerusalem and he's going to land, uh, it, it, somehow his feet are going to land on the on Mount of Olives, the Mount will split in two. The kingdom, the, you know, the Muslims sealed up the Eastern Gate. You know this. And they put a cemetery, a Muslim cemetery. Why? Because Cohen's religious, the priestly uh, families of Israel will not go into a pagan cemetery. So the Muslims, it's, we understand it's okay. You know, it's like, okay, we're going to seal up the gate because the prophecy says he's going to come through the Eastern Gate when he returns. And he's not going to walk over through this through this uh, cemetery, so we're going to stop this Jewish Messiah. These are not the brightest bulbs on the tree, but they're very sincere. So they plant this cemetery. Maybe you've been there. And they still at the gate. And right or wrong, whether it was in the flesh or in the spirit, I know not. I climbed the back of that eastern gate, uh, the, the Palestinian. Oh, Luis, take a picture quick. Then, never mind. Okay, I digress. I digress. Okay. What is so fascinating about Petra, Basra, before the Lord goes to the Mount of Olives? Why, why Petra? Do you know, in, write this down, it's not in your notes, Daniel chapter 11. Read Daniel 11 at around verse 41, 2 and 3. It speaks to the Antichrist. What I find so fascinating is that the Antichrist will affect all the world except, we're not given a reason why, except for the area of Oman, Edom, and Moab. What is that today? That is the country of Jordan. What's in Jordan is Petra. The Lord, like he hardened Pharaoh's heart and manipulated Pharaoh's heart, the Lord is going to control the situation with the Antichrist. The Antichrist will affect all the world except for this small region. Why do you suppose that is? This region is where the Jews are going to flee for protection from the Antichrist. Fascinating. Fascinating. God is in control, not Satan. Okay, then beginning in chapter 40 of Ezekiel, the prophet speaks to the millennial temple. There are gonna be two more temples. One is the tribulation temple. That's, it's gonna be a bad time for Israel. That's the temple the Antichrist is gonna stand upon and call himself Messiah, all of that. I had a rabbi sit across the table from me in Chicago when we were in Chicago. Very 
famous rabbi, president of the yeshiva, anyway, but he says, yeah, you got, you, you, you messianics, you've been told what you see, love is what you have, we do, yeah. But yet your theology says when the next coming, you get all excited about the temple. He says, but doesn't your theology say when the next temple is erected that bad things are going to happen to us like another Holocaust? And I, I said, yeah, my friend, you're right. I said, of course, our emphasis is not the bad things, but the return of. That's a precursor to the return of the Mashiach. He goes, I know, I'm just messing with you. But listen, <laughs> listen, that's a true story. That's a true story. And, uh, but he's right. You know, people, we get excited about the temple, and I, I do too, it's fascinating. There's a temple research institute there, you see all this stuff, they're preparing for the next temple. But that next temple is gonna be a really bad situation for Israel. So we can get excited about it, but put it in the context that, okay, we really gotta be praying for Israel. Because once that thing is erected, okay, but there's gonna be another temple. This is the one we're really looking we forget that. It's the millennial temple where Jesus rules and reigns for, it says, a thousand years. And that temple is described, chapter 40 of Ezekiel, all the way through the end of the book. And it's very detailed. And if you're not one for details, it can put you to sleep. So if you have insomnia, start reading that chapter. Be fascinated. And of course, it's some brother said, I listened to the news and yeah, it would be kind of that. It's all right. But today, let's wrap this up. Today, okay, local conflict, which is what has been going on, will change and has changed the Middle East. Things will never go back. That toothpaste is out of the tube right now. Things have radically changed. There are, going to be changed. There are changes unfolding. In a minute, this thing could go global. Hezbollah, Iran, and Hamas are still launching rockets. If Iran steps foot into Israel via rocket or soldier, forgive me, but all hell is going to break loose. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, look up. Be ready, pray, watch, discern the signs of the times. We're not looking for spectacular signs. We're looking for inward signs. We're looking for ultimately the Messiah, but we're looking for the true signs that are written within scripture. Not some fancy fancy celebrity writing a book telling you, those of you old enough or believers, and there were this, it's got 88 reasons in 88, you may have heard about that. Of course, uh, that Jesus would return. Well, it didn't happen. He sold the book for two fifty. I at that time that was a lot of money. But I'm thinking, okay, if you really believe the Lord's coming back, you give it away. Number one. But I just it's just me. But he sold it for two fifty. People bought the book. And I'm not making this up. In nineteen eighty nine it didn't happen. He so he wrote a sequel. Oh, I made a mistake. Eighty nine reasons in eighty nine. He sold the book and it's like for three bucks and change. People <laughs> bought the book. After the second book, I think he's in the Caribbean still. Okay? All right, never mind. I digress. Be careful of the sabinaceous quack solvers, the, the slippery salesmen. I'm not against salesmen, you know, he does a noble job, but those, those charlatans. Be careful. Be careful. This thing could go global, and that will change the world. So, okay, to wrap it up, and then maybe we'll leave it open for questions. It's up to the pastor. You, uh, let me know, Pastor. But what we're doing here, so what? Why look, why study the signs of the times? Why talk about this? Number one, we are looking for Jesus. Number two, we want to recognize the true signs. We understand the restoration has begun of Israel. It's progressive. We understand that there is local conflict and then there will be global conflict. Now we've experienced global, and now in the Middle East it's very local. But it will go global again. We understand Gog and Magog is a power entity from the north, whether it's Turkey or today Russia. Names may change. These are 20th century, uh, 21st century names. They may be called something else in 10 years. But a power entity from the north empowers Persia, 
which creates this coalition that comes against Israel, and that there will be labor pains throughout this process, and each labor pain becomes more intense than the previous labor pain. And the pain the baby we're giving birth to is thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We are praying for even so come, Lord Jesus. We are praying for the peace of Jerusalem, thus praying, even so come, Lord Jesus, as we learn today. So we're looking for the kingdom. So believer, be alert, discern the signs of the times, watch, pray, look up, understand what the scripture says. Be wise to what's going on right in front of you right now. We, have, we worship and praise the God of love, but he is a just God, and he is a consuming fire as well. There's a time and a place for that. And what we thank God for is that he is slow to flare his nostrils. Aren't you glad for that? Mm -hmm. Because he's very patient with us. And he gives us second chances day after day after day. I'm so glad he doesn't flare his nostrils. Too. But he does flare his nostrils. Three things, as I said this morning, if you think of us at all, we covet your prayers. Second, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so doing you are praying for the Lord to return. And again, if God touches your heart to help us feed the children, the Holocaust survivors, all these people we feed and minister in. You saw the map. You saw all the areas were all over Israel. They know we're there. And we have touched thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of meals. And if you remember anything else, I want you to remember these three things. Time is short. Life is precious. The person sitting next to you, beside you, behind you is precious in the sight of God. Value each moment you have with that person, your family, your friend. Time is short. Life is precious. And, yes, Jesus is so thank you for helping us feed the kids in Israel. Congregation, uh, before we turn it over to the pastor, and maybe Q&A, whatever he decides. But before that, I want to thank you once again for coming out this evening, for your loving kindness, for your attentiveness. Make sure you let us know which book you want, if you haven't done so already, and you put that in the basket back there. And just thank you for your hospitality. And pastor, for your hospitality, affording me this opportunity. It's been 12 years now. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity once again to be with your precious congregation. Thank you, Pastor. Love you, my friend, dear old friend. And shalom and blessings to